Hello, and welcome to Cybeats Powerhouse Perspective. With me today is Scott Towsley. Thanks for joining us, Scott, and particularly the last minute. You know, uh, somebody with your background showing up like this is kind of how we avoid having ants. My pleasure. So, uh, yeah, for, for those following along at home, I'm uh, right now about a mile east of East Key, stuck on top of Cross Bank, um, working my way up the Keys. Where in the world are you today, Scott? I am in Ashburn, Virginia. Our offices overlook the end of the Silver Line Metro whenever it opens. That's where we are. Whenever it opens or catches fire, whichever it does first. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll live with opens. Yeah. Open would be better. So, yeah, as we discussed, you know, in this in this series, you know, we tend to talk to folks like you with amazing backgrounds about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going in situational awareness writ large. Right. You know, with you know, so much of my professional life the last three years particularly has been focused on supply chain information, you know, security and sharing all that. But being an old ISAC person as the ICS ISAC is getting rebooted and spending a lot of time thinking about that again. I see different maturity levels in creating situational awareness and sharing it and putting it together. Um, your entire, you know, history, you know, starts in many of the classic ways a lot of the folks we know. And follows those that interesting path, you know, going through Splunk recently and tying that all together to what you're doing now. So looking back, you know, how has um, Anthony, question number one, uh, how do we phrase that? Yeah, you know, how did the value of clarity change over your career? You know, from, you know, a young, young guy in the army, you know, through all that, it's all been situational awareness. How has that morphed? The old... Chinese phrase of may you live in interesting times, you know, the phrase curse, whatever it's called. <clears throat> I've really been blessed professionally to have two things happen in a lot of my professional life. One is that I've done different kinds of things because I'm sort of built to learn different things, do different things at different times and so on. So my experience is a little bit military, a little bit of really interesting engineering challenges, different commercial opportunities, served as a civil servant at DHS, et cetera. And at the same time all that was happening, the world was getting increasingly hyper-networked. And so for somebody like me that has a lot of interests, it's almost like the Easter buffet grew 15 more rooms and it's hard to make a selection of what to work on or do. And that actually sometimes hurts the challenge of keeping clarity in the middle of what you're doing, no matter what you're doing at what particular time. It's, it's important to stay focused and clear in the details of what you're doing and using clarity for that sort of purpose. But at the same time, all of us are challenged with how to operate in a collaborative, open, connected, effective way, when again, that actually makes it harder to keep focused on a clarity and get this done today or this done this week or stay focused on it. Uh, as an old pastor friend of mine said one time, keep the main thing, the main thing. And every day I try and keep the main thing, the main thing, but it's not easy because a lot of things make it hard to sustain good clarity for whatever you're working on. You know, it's, you know, the, the uh, you know, I, I, Isaac Newton or uh, Coleridge, I think, you know, were, were reportedly the last people to have read everything written in their language, you know, and since then <laughs> it's been impossible to do that. You know, yeah. the, you know, there's too much written down and, you know, and that's an old saw, um, whether that's literally true of either of them, you know, it's true enough. You could have at that time if you had a long life and then and, and put it just to that purpose. One of the defining characteristics of this entire era we're in is that increasingly not even not even folks like you and I, you know, sort of advanced specialties can keep up with what happens in our specialty today. You know, it's just not possible and it will increase. You know, there's a Moore's law. There's an inevitability curve going with this. We'll get more and more information. And, you know, I see a lot of, you know, in, in common conversation, there's a fair bit of despair about that. Right? It's like, oh, you know, we'll never be able to figure things out. But as I say, I've been sailing these boats up the, the back country of the Keys, you know, for the last couple of weeks. And it's a fascinating analogy to all of this because, you know, since I've been stuck here for six days, I know a great deal about Cross Bank. And there was a little, you know, baby nurse shark about four feet long that comes around often. There was two big blue crabs fighting. I can tell you an awful lot about it and other spots along the way, you know, but not, you know, and, and you could put a whole research team right here on this spot with 100, within 100 feet and produce data 
you know, almost endlessly. Yeah. So it isn't really necessarily anything new, right? You know, we have, you know, sailors of old and all of us have always gotten through life by, you know, not paying as much attention as we could to everything, but finding ways to pay enough, enough attention to some things. And in the, you know, in the, the two major information sharing threads in my head right now, and, you know, the, in the, in what we're, we call ISACs, you know, this, you know, threat intelligence or whatever sharing thing and then the supply chain thing, you know, it's it, more so in the latter as we, because a less mature conversation, we're working through it. We get into these same sort of issues of detail, I think, right? Where it's like, well, I can't share that because everybody gets my IP. And you have well, to narrow it down and we, say, it's, you're sharing with the same people you already share with, right? The information, of course, is out there exploding, but it's actually the data that's relevant to information. The context you need to have a sense of around a particular body of information that you're trying to drive in a clear sense to a decision or do I understand the problem right? All of this is, you know, expanding massively. It's a little bit like the universe, black hole, you know, big bang expansion of, of, the, of the universe, those sorts of things. Um, and so it's why it's hard to keep your finger on the key parts enough so that you're confident that you're doing the right action, helping guide the right decision, all those sorts of things. Yeah, you know, and it's the, you know, but I think we're working through those things. And so, Anthony, if you can supply us the the present question, how do we phrase that? You know, I, as I look at, you know, the the conversation I had today with the ICS ISAC, you know, uh, public sector leadership board, right? You know, folks who have built a lot of this these these pieces and chunks, and how do we have this conversation? You know, it, but it, but it builds on. You know, ten years ago when we started, when Sean McGurk and I started the ICS ISAC. I found myself in the beltway a lot, you know, sort of yep. hunting people down and, and explaining the entire thing and give uh, major credit to Mark Weatherford and uh, General Michael Hayden. He was understanding it better than anybody. And Hayden particularly, you know, amazing, uh, amazing individual because we're on this path, you know, just taking the ISACs, you know, there was a 1998 presidential policy directive that said there shall be an singular ISAC. Now, immediately thereafter, you know, we end up with the sector coordinating councils and everything else, you know, because yep. people started six, seven, eight, you know, nine of them. Um, Sean and I came along, you know, you know, and me naively saying, well, we should have one of these and it should be vertical, you know, vertically integrated with the vendors and the integrators and everything else, which wasn't the standard model. Well, at the time. That is that is where I got started was in the National Infrastructure Protection Center coming out of that 1998 direction. So I, I'm a plank holder, if you think of it in those terms. Well, it, it, that's that's fascinating because I think about as I think about this other conversation, I don't know. I wasn't right. You know, and I, I wasn't involved before that. And obviously there was this working groups and conversations that led up to that uh, uh, PPD. And just like, you know, Alan Freeman in, in the NTIA and Department of Commerce led up to the executive order for SBOMs. Um, and it's and it all made sense. You know, undoubtedly, folks like you, you know, bright people thinking about it. And you still come out with a policy director that says we need a singular private sector information <laughs> sharing center and a little, you know, so you start things moving, you know, again, like sailing, you move further along. I am stuck on this bank, but I'm closer to my objective. You know, now I know more things. I can focus on this, work out the details. So there's, a or there's an old back. phrase in the land of the blind, the one eyed person is king. So right. you may not need to have it all just somewhere to start when you're getting something truly started at the, at the early foundation all of it. Right. And that, that's the, that's where I'm, the point I'm not quite making, right? You know, is that is that I think, you know, I think about these conversations with with Weatherford and Hayden and, and you know, this amazing group of folks, you know, 10 years ago. And you know, we tend to look at the present and say, all right, here's the structure we have. Say, so, yes, but we got there because these things happen. Now we're here. It'll be, you know, maybe it's the one eyed man in the blank, you know, but you have one eye. You can see. And what you can see is this area has a six inch time, not a foot and a half, damn it. Or you know, or we need multiple and the, you know, and to, to, you know, so, so the, you know, where I came into the ISAC world, I'm thinking they need to be say 2000 in the U S right. Mm -hmm. I'm just, just thinking, you know, like population, the number of different demographics, how many people, organizations going to have in a sharing group and still be functional and so forth. And, and, uh, and we've slowly moved that way, you know, since, uh, since that uh, uh, PBD, you know, there was the group, of ISACs, there's a National Council of ISACs yep. now. 
Uh, Bill Nelson, you know, had led the financial sector ISAC uh, forever and uh, left uh, fairly recently and created the uh, uh, Global Resilience Federation, which has the manufacturing ISAC and, uh, ISAC and several others. Uh, um, uh, Deb Kobza, who created the National Health ISAC, um, left earlier and created what's now the GSRA based out of Kennedy, where the ICS ISAC is. Yep. So we're, we're at this point now along the path where it's like, no, not a singular one. You know, that, you know, faded really quickly. You know, we need multiple and the sector coordinating councils and the NIP and all the other things around that, you know, the National Infrastructure, Infrastructure Protection Plan, you know, if, which has developed since. And, but now we're at the stage where there's, you know, at least three groups and there's first.org and there's other groups of information sharing organizations kind of all over the place. It also um, reminds me of my good friend, Faye Francie, who came out of the aviation world in these things. And now she's building and running the automotive auto. ISAC, which is inherently an ICS sort of commercialized entity and activity. And again, it just illustrates the great complexity of all of these different areas in different ways. Well, and I think, but I think the answer, you know, and this has been a stable answer since I've got to get involved with, uh, with ISACs is that, you know, and it, it speaks to our, our question, what are the path forward? You know, an organization should probably belong to an ISAC um, or have a good partner who does. And a big organization should probably belong to a couple. Now, all? No. I mean, nobody connects to, you know, this is not how the internet yeah. works. It's not how the telephone system works. Um well, the, the thing running through my mind, because I looked at the question and thought about what I wanted to bring up, you know, I had the, the blessing in the mid nine early 90s of teaching physics at West Point when I was in the Army in those days. And there was an argument back then that was, you know, very clear going on amongst the faculty. We were training undergraduates that were going to become officers, and they were starting to do a lot of work in a new discipline called systems engineering. And the argument was, don't you need to learn something about a specific area or two or three before you then start figuring out the systems versions of things and stuff like that. And I think that plays into questions of ISACs and ICS and stuff like that. You've got to find a way to somehow bring together specific knowledge from different areas that makes you more effective in figuring out ways to contribute about how to combine or blend or systematize them or what might be done. And I'm a huge fan of, you know, professional diversity and try and avoid zeros in your own kit bag of experiences where people like us, we may not be career uh, HR people or career customer service or other sorts of areas, but you need to have some of that sense-making experience also as you try and figure out this or that primarily, you know, in your mind, technical area of something or other. And so much of this is organizational science and dynamics and practices. And then the other thing that, you know, I think is a pass to consider question. I know, you know, there's the long standing comment that, you know, going to law school is always or almost always a good thing, not because it helps you be a lawyer if that's what you're going to do or whatever, but the legal thinking and training is valuable in so many different areas. And my biggest advice on the past today is statistics, 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 because all of us came out of school worlds that were still, in effect, the outcomes of the space race and NASA things and, and beat the Soviets to the moon and calculus based things. But today you need to have a really solid grounding in statistical thinking to be able to make use of data and get to clarity and get to understanding when almost everything we're dealing with is not fixed. It is massive data flows and sense making out of an awful lot of data and information. Right. Which takes us, you know, into the, into that, you know, looking to the future, right. You know, the, uh, uh, and again, Anthony, how did we say that? So, right. Yeah. You know, I thought about this one, you know, because, you know, but, Dear friend, you know, and uh, iterative colleague, and I think has been guesting this show already, uh, Stu Phillips, you know, back in the late 90s when we were working together at Cisco, um, explained to me, you know, the the issue of how things get adopted. You know, and he's a he's a premier sale, sales uh, 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 creature. And, you know, with Cisco, we, we changed, we fixed some things about the product, but mostly we fixed the messaging and said, look, the world's moving forward. You know, the world's changing whether you like it or not. You know, and your choices right now will determine who wins and loses. 
And I don't mean if the Russians hack your kidneys. I mean, your competitor will get on the internet faster and will adopt mm -hmm. that better and get more market share, lower cost, be more productive and competitive. And will probably buy you eventually, right? Um, uh, which, which is not your goal. And, you know, so today we, you know, with all the, you know, supply chain, supply chain security is such an important thing in my world right now. And it is for security, I mean, actual security. But I look at this, you know, the financial customers and the manufacturing customers, and everything else, and, and you know, through my, my day job, but also just, you know, all the working groups, what I see is efficiency, right? You know, that if you're still doing things the way you are today, say 10 years from now, you're probably not in business. And specifically what we're talking about, you know, let the information flow, think about it. Don't be, you know, from a security perspective, an IP pr pr uh, protection perspective, don't just be foolish, but, you know, don't be too timid because, you know, you need to have, you're going to have in 10 years so much more information, um, you know, plug for the, uh, for the SBOM get together with, with yep. Alan and folks on uh, Monday at, at RSA, right? What we're doing there is saying it's 20 years from now. Let's debate that. You know, it's 20 years later in cyber in in supply chain security. What does the world look like, right? And and I, you know, being the optimist, what I'm going to say is there's a lot of efficiencies. A lot of companies who lag behind, are out of business, have been acquired because you can no longer just say I I mostly know what's going on in my supply chain or my logistics. <laughs> it's year to year. So, what do you think? Yeah, I'm reminded of the old phrase that true intelligence is holding two conflicting ideas in your head at the same time. And the fact is that you've got to find a way to be efficient, but also effective. You've got to find ways to operate successfully today, but also tomorrow. Um, it also is important to stop occasionally and ask yourself, you know, almost in a, a bit of a risk background question, what are the formative experiences that are in the minds right now of everybody engaged in these conversations? And are those the right ones or are we missing other lessons that aren't so much out of yesterday's news and trying to think a little bit about, you know, creative things, not overlooking the blind spots. You know, I had a good experience with some folks after 9-11 looking at unexpected possibilities that people had not thought about. And, and the particular outcomes they did were not important. The fact that they went through the exercise of trying to think through various differences and perspectives so that they didn't end up locked in what they expected the answers to be. That's something that's very, very important. You know, all of us are going to be eternally, in my opinion, wrestling with our threats have the initiative. And you're always unfortunately, having to do some playing whack-a-mole of responding to whatever they choose to do. And I also think the some of the military concepts and principles are useful to think about in some of these awareness areas. The, the idea of scouting, reconnaissance, screening, movement to contact, all of that sort of work that I remember when I was a lieutenant and a captain that we were trying to think about how to deal with the big Soviet army in the full day gap sort of things when we were going to be outnumbered. And there are parts of that that may be relevant to how do you protect your organization? How do you make it better when the possibilities of different threats are not just sophisticated, but there are very many of them. And how do you find a way to successfully prepare against those, be clear and, and aware about those sorts of things and lean into the areas and, you know, the other phrase that I liked was um, an officer that I worked for in Germany in those days had a phrase, make haste slowly, meaning move, get something done, get the things done you need to, but never lose the situational awareness, the clarity of the bigger picture and why you're choosing this or that today or tomorrow. And you've got to find a way to balance those two things in your head working slowly and deliberately for tomorrow and beyond, working quickly with what you've chosen to do for today and have both of those in your head operating effectively at the same time, most of the time. Yeah. I've got to throw another uh, phrase, you know, Fred Cohen and I spent a lot of time working together and uh, yep. you know, the, the uh, at, uh, at Unisys, you know, uh, when I was at Unisys and Fred was supporting me, we, we put together an innovation plan, you know, for the executive team and so forth. And, uh, and the, the the phrase avoiding strategic surprise yep. you know it sounded like what you said at the beginning you shouldn't be 
you know, strategically surprised. You know, I really didn't see that coming. And with all the day to day work, I'm really enjoying the, the strategy title at this point in my career because it's, you know, it means doing all the things so you can understand what's going on, but always looking forward. Well, I've read I've read most of Nassim Talib's work and the Black Swan stuff, but I really think we all need to think what we can do about gray swans, things that in hindsight don't actually surprise us so much. In hindsight, the OPM hack shouldn't have surprised anybody. Right. I don't care the particulars, but in hindsight, you know, solar winds or log 4J actually shouldn't surprise anybody when you think about it. So how can we get better at preempting or anticipating or leaning into what I would call gray swans, things that are unlikely, but in hindsight, maybe not so much, you know? Well, it's stuck that, you know, they remember when, the, when that hit the public uh, uh, awareness, I always remember this one conversation with a journalist who was just a, a, a non-US journalist who was trying to pin me down on, is it America, you know, living in a glass house and throwing rocks? And I was making that point. It's like, you know, this is, what, what year was that? You know, 2016, 2010, anyways. Uh, it all runs together. It's like, this is the kind of thing that happens about now, you know, whatever, you know, it, you know, whoever it is doing, you know, this sort of thing to somebody. And it was 1992, three, I think the first borderware event ever. I mean, those 10 by 10 foot booth, these two young guys came up with a bunch of good questions and, uh, and, 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 and uh, from an oil company and uh, you yeah, know, I've been worried about, I've worked in, in ICS and OTA general electric before that. And it just slipped my mind as we're building this new firewall thing. You know, this is for the, you know, and we go back to the team and, you know, can we add support for SCADA protocols in DC? No, just can't. we got six, you know, six people and a dog and the banks are buying firewalls like crazy. And in 2000 at, at Cisco with, you know, with global dominating, you had a you know half billion dollar or more annual you know, revenue and had the exact same conversation. And the reality was we couldn't do it. You know, there was no way, you know, as a public company with fiduciary responsibility to increase shareholder values for all the you know, retired people who invest in Cisco, I cannot put engineers on this, you know, when they can, you know, do better work. You know, and but especially the for the ICS, come, yes, yep. especially for the ICS thinking in world, I'm a huge fan of the professional work Nancy Levison up at MIT has done because she's really focused for, for many, many years on complex system safety. And figuring out how to get better as an organization, better protected, better handle on risk for complex ITOT stuff that you're thinking about for safety reasons is right adjacent and overlapped with the security questions. And you can't focus on one or the other. You've got to think holistically about how to try and somehow connect in a logical way from an operator's perspective, from a strategy, from a business leadership perspective, how to make things better in both of those directions because they're inherently connected. Well, I, I can't think any better place to end this with than with that uh, dirt, dirt gently uh, reference, right? You know, it's the holistic detective agency, everything really is connected. And uh, Scott, thank you for everything you've done for the, for the country, you know, for the industry and your career. Thanks for your time today. And uh, look forward to more and more of these conversations whenever you'd like. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate the opportunity to join you today and to wish I was there in the in the in the keys with you. We'll get that done. Thanks, folks. Thank you.